Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Mark's for this second Sunday of Advent. It is good to be here together to worship. And no matter how that happens, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online, it is good to be together. Uh, and I thank you for taking the time to worship with us. In recognition of those who walked this land before us here in Simcoe County, we acknowledge that we gather on the ancestral territory of the Anishinaabek nations, the Ojibwe, Adawa, and Potawatomi, who collectively are known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We remember, too, the people of the Wendat who once made this land their home. We acknowledge with regret that in the past we have not lived in harmony with the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, and our relationship has not been one of true friendship based on honesty, generosity, and mutual respect. I hope we can all acknowledge that we have much to learn from the history and culture and teachings of the Indigenous peoples with whom we now share this land. May we be committed to nurturing a spirit of respect and honesty and reconciliation with all of our First Nations, Métis, and Inuit neighbours. Well, there is one special day that I am aware of that we are celebrating within our congregation this week. On Saturday the 16th, it's Anna's Wicker's birthday. That's nice. So let's sing to Anna. This week, there are uh, several act, uh, or a few activities, anyway, that are happening within our congregation. Uh, Knit One Pray Two continues to meet on Tuesday morning. Last week, it was like Santa's workshop here as we were <laughs> making uh, making the decorations. They're not on the tree yet, but they will be um, for our tree that uh, everyone gets to take one home on Christmas Eve. Um, and on Wednesday morning, the women's breakfast out at the Curling Club at Barnfield Point, that's going to happen at 8.30. So uh, come and tell your friends and, and bring a friend with you, and it will be a delightful time to catch up. On Thursday, um, so you, have, you get breakfast on Wednesday, and then you go home and bake, because <laughs> Thursday is when you deliver all that baking to the church for our cookie uh, carryout, which is happening on Wednesday. Friday. So if anyone has been busy baking, and I hope everyone has, um, you can drop off your cookies and squares to the church Thursday. What time, Lori? Anytime after 10. Anytime after 10. And Lori promises not to eat them all. There will be some left for the trays. Um, a reminder that next Sunday evening on December the 17th, we have our longest night service. And that is particularly designed for those who will find Christmas to be a difficult time this year. It could be for any number of reasons, but just anyone who might be having a hard time with Christmas. So if you know of anyone who that fits that description, um, I would ask that you would invite them to come with you to that service. I know that it can be hard to walk into a building you may never have been in before and not know a lot of people by yourself, especially when you're feeling vulnerable. So if you know of someone uh, who would fit that description, please invite them to come and bring them with you and be a support for them. Um, I want to thank you all for your gifts of love for the families of Harriet Todd who are having a difficult time providing for their kids this year. If you look over here, you can see the overflowing abundance with which we responded to Lori's invitation um, to bring in warm clothes and winter clothes for adults and kids, uh, mostly kids. Um, and Lori will be delivering them tomorrow to, uh, to Harriet Todd. So thank you so much for your generosity. And thank you to Lori for heading up this initiative. And finally, a reminder of our Advent challenge. There are um, little books out on the front table if you haven't picked one up yet. But we, the session has chosen three ministries to support um, as, as we as a congregation can give together uh, to support them at Christmas time. This is something we do each Advent. 
And this year we are choosing uh, to replant all of trees in Palestine. As you can imagine, um, this time has been difficult not only for the people in Palestine, but also for the olive trees, which will, will grow for generations and generations. And they have, many of them have been destroyed during this time of war. And, and it, they are a source of livelihood for so many people. So we will be uh, supporting the replanting of olive trees, uh, food sustainability in various areas of the world through Presbyterian World Service and Development. And also we're going to be supporting Indigenous ministries here in Canada. So if you would like to participate in our Advent Challenge this year, please mark uh, your envelope with the words Advent Challenge and designate how much is to go towards that Advent Challenge. Irene, is, are there any other announcements? Okay. Oh, just uh, one more reminder about our Christmas services. Just so you, so you can plan for you and your family, this Christmas Eve service uh, will happen at 5 o'clock this year. We're moving it up a little bit earlier, so it's a little, maybe a little bit lighter um, when you come to, uh, to worship. We will also be having a service that morning as it is Sunday morning. So that will be Advent 4 in the morning and Christmas Eve at 5 o'clock. Let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship God. In our Advent series, we're celebrating the gift of being truly present to each other and to the call of God to make this world a better place. We can be the gift of presence with those who are experiencing life as less than peaceful. But this might also be true of how we are personally feeling in this moment. Our lives can feel a bit chaotic or in need of a makeover. The good news is that God is continually making a way for do-overs. In this week, we can find peace even when life doesn't feel so peaceful. This week, we focus on what it means to be a gift of non-anxious presence for those who need it the most. wrap a present on this second Sunday of Advent with great anticipation for the gift that God will reveal. The promise of peace is the divine gift we receive. The gift of peace reminds us that we can have serenity even in the midst of non-peaceful situations. Peace is not simply the absence of conflict. Peace is an ever-present gift that we can open at any time when we stop and breathe and trust that we are never alone. And the gift of peace we can give is to be present for those who feel alone. Well, <laughs> okay. What can I give I would bring a
Please join with me in prayer. Let us pray together. Holy, living light of God, you are our peaceful presence. Let this peace grow in our lives each day so we can be a present of peace to others. Unwrap and open our hearts. May it be so. Amen. Our first hymn is O Day of Peace, which is number 732 in our book of praise. And if you're able, I would invite you to stand and, as we sing together. I would invite you to greet those who are worshiping around you by sharing these words, the love of Christ be with you and also with you. Now I'm going to invite you to come forward for a little time with me, if you would like, Brian. Yes. I never really know where to sit when the candles are on. So shall we sit on on this side? Why didn't we sit on the candles? Sitting on the candles. That would be a that would be an exciting a hot time in the old town tonight, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it is good to see you. How was your week? It was good. Good. I hang out with Phoenix and Lulu. My little cat got a shirt that says Christmas. Oh, that's wonderful. We have sweaters. Okay. Well, that's, that sounds like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now, did you ever hear of someone or a character named Winnie the Pooh? Yeah. How many of you have heard of Winnie the Pooh? <laughs> I love Winnie the Pooh, and I love little Piglet, too. Piglet is Winnie's little friend, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, he's very sweet. Now, I want to share with you a little piece from a, 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 a book about Winnie the Pooh that was written by a person called A. A. Milne. And this is about a conversation that Piglet and Pooh had together. So I want you to listen for just a second, okay? Mm -hmm. Today was a difficult day, said Pooh. There was a pause. Do you want to talk about it, asked Piglet. No, said Pooh after a bit. No, I don't think I do. That's okay, said Piglet, and he came and sat beside his friend. Aww. What are you doing, asked Pooh. Nothing really, said Piglet, only I know what difficult days are like. I quite often don't feel like talking about it on my difficult days either. But goodness, continued Piglet, difficult days are so much easier when you know you've got someone there for you, and I'll always be here for you, Pooh. And as Pooh sat there working through in his head his difficult day, while the solid, reliable Piglet sat next to him quietly, swinging his little legs, he thought that his best friend had never been more right. Isn't that nice? 
Piglet knew what it was like to have a difficult day, so he just came and was with his friend. And you know what? Sometimes in this world, there are lots of difficult days, many difficult days lately. And sometimes what we need is someone to be with us and just sit with us quietly to help us through our difficult time. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a little bit of homework for this week. If someone is having a difficult day, can you be like Piglet and just be there for them? Yeah. Just sit with them and help them through their difficult day? Yeah, but sometimes when people have difficult days, they yell at me and they tell me to F off. Oh, well, that's not very nice. Maybe we'll find other people that don't tell you that because that's a hard thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you do your best with that. And sometimes it can even be a big person who's having a difficult day and they really appreciate you sitting with them, okay? Mm -hmm. And for you big people out there, you can do the same thing. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And I know that you're going to have Sunday school today with Penny, I believe. <laughs> I think that's words to live by. <laughs> we won't sit on the candles. <laughs> I'm now going to invite Helen to come forward and share with us our scripture readings for today. When I was here the last time, I told you there might be uh, questions after this the sermon. Well, so much for pulling a joke on the, the new guy up here doing the scriptures. There was no questions. <laughs> so there won't be any questions today either. <laughs> the scripture readings are Isaiah 40, 1 to 11, and 2 Peter 3, 8 to 15a. Leader, console my people, give them comfort, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem's heart and tell them that this time of service is ended. A voice cries out, clear a path through the wilderness for Huawei. Make a straight road through the desert for our God. Let every valley be filled in, every mountain and hill be laid. Let every cliff become a plain, and the bridges become a valley. Go up on a high mountain, you who bring good news to Zion. Shout with a loud voice, you who bring good news to Jerusalem. Shout without fear, and say to the towns of Judah, Here is your God. Like a shepherd, you feed your flock, gathering the lambs, and leading mother views and gentleness. The prophet Isaiah lived in a time of exile perpetrated on the Hebrews by the Babylonians. By the time we get to chapter 40, one of our readings for today, Isaiah's disciples are writing after the exile has ended. In this part of the book, we hear themes of comfort and peace and the possibility that the paths of our lives can be cleared for a new life. We also hear that we are always held in the peaceful presence of our God. Let us read these excerpts responsibly. <laughs> we already did that, didn't we? <laughs> Shows I'm not paying attention. <laughs> the new churches of the first century church were encouraged by the writer of the letters called First and Second Peter. These churches were living in a confusing time as they struggled with the belief that Jesus' return was imminent, but was not yet coming to fruition. In our reading today, the writer invites them to wait with peaceful hearts even in the midst of what feels like chaos. Hear this excerpt from the second letter of Peter. This point must not be overlooked, dear friends, in the eyes of the Most High. One day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. 
God does not delay in keeping promises, as some mean delay. Rather, God shows you generous patience, desiring that no one perish, but that all come to repentance. But what we await are new heavens and a new earth where, according to the promise, God's justice will reside. So, beloved, while waiting for this, make every effort to be found at peace and without stain or defilement in God's sight. Consider our God's patience as your opportunity for salvation. choir and Terry that was beautiful the second gospel reading of Advent from the gospel according to Mark is from the very beginning of the book setting up the idea that this story of Jesus will be a transformative experience drawing on the prophet Isaiah Mark tells his readers that God is making a way in the most difficult of places clearing open paths in the desert places. John the Baptist shows up in Advent, as he typically does, a sign that the time has come when the Messiah, born of the Spirit, will be present among us. Listen now for the word of the Lord. Here begins the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it was written in Isaiah the prophet, I send my messenger before you to prepare your way, a herald's voice in the desert, crying, Make clear the way of our God, clear a straight path, up a straight path. And so John the baptizer appeared in the desert, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to John and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. 
as they confessed their sins. John was clothed in camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and he ate nothing but grasshoppers and wild honey. In the course of his preaching, John said, One more powerful than I is to come after me. I am not fit to stoop and untie his sandal straps. I have baptized you in water, but the one to come will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, it happened just this past summer. I was getting to, ready to leave my cottage. I'd packed everything up. I'd carried it down to the boat. I'd put it in the boat and was just getting ready to start the motor when I thought to myself, oh, my sunglasses. And so I said to my kids, I forgot something, just give me a second. And then I left them all in the boat, kids and grandchildren, while I ran up the hill, or at least as close an approximation to running as I get these days. <laughs> and I looked on the porch, and there were no sunglasses. And I unlocked the cottage, and I went in, and I looked in all the usual places, and again, no luck, no sunglasses. Well, I didn't want to keep them all waiting too long, so I resigned myself to the fact that I would be without my sunglasses until I made it back to the cottage. And I walked down the hill to the boat. And someone asked, what was it you forgot? And I told them I was looking for my sunglasses. And I think all of my grandchildren at once said, you mean the ones on your head? <laughs> I had probably spent 10 minutes looking for something I already had, something that was as close as the top of my head. Now, as I was remembering that rather embarrassing incident, I was reminded of a story that I heard from a colleague a few years ago. It happened to him even before the advent of cell phones. And he was waiting, uh, a friend of his was coming into town and they'd agreed to meet at a hotel um, at, and they were going to meet in the lobby of this hotel at about six o'clock. So he arrived a few minutes before six and he got a seat in the hotel where he could keep an eye on the entire lobby and on the front door because he didn't want to miss his friend. At 6.30, there was no sign of his friend. At 6.45, he was starting to worry that something may have happened to his friend. And then at 7 o'clock, a hotel employee approached him and said, Are you Reverend Michael? And he said, Yes. And he said, Well, your friend is here. And he said, But that's impossible. I've been here for an hour waiting for him, and, and I haven't seen him. And the employee of the hotel said, Sir, this is a very large hotel, and we have two lobbies. Michael had been waiting for someone who was already there. He was looking for someone who had already arrived. Now, in many ways, these stories remind me a bit of Advent. In the Christian tradition, we start each new church year with the season of Advent, four weeks of waiting and preparing for the incarnation, for God coming to the world in the person of a tiny baby, the Christ child. Four weeks of watching and waiting and hoping and praying. Now, our Advent season is a curious thing because it's the kind of waiting and watching my friend was doing in that hotel. We're waiting for someone who's already here. We're waiting for Christ who is present here through the power of the Holy Spirit. Advent scriptures tell us to watch and to look, but like my sunglasses, we're looking for something we already have. The one who saves us is already in our midst through word and sacraments, through this community of faith. God's spirit is already among us. Now, you may recall that two weeks ago on Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday before Advent, 
we heard that the Savior we're looking for is right in front of our eyes. And we're called to see him in the hungry and the thirsty and the naked and the ill and the imprisoned. Jesus reminded us that what we do for them, we do for Jesus. For the people Jesus was speaking to that day, that came as a surprise. And for many today, that message is also a surprise every time. Well, as I have said, the word Advent means coming or arrival. And during these four weeks before Christmas, we're waiting and focusing on different ways that Christ comes into this world. As Reverend Renninger says, we know that he came to us at Christmas, born of Mary, greeted by Magi. Christ has already come, and we know that he's coming again in glory. The scriptures assure us that he is coming again to settle accounts and reveal the truth. And Christ is present in your life and in mine right now each day. The coming one is already here. Are we paying attention to where God is showing up in our lives? Or are we missing connecting with God who is as close as those sunglasses were on my head? Diana Butler Bass, who I have mentioned to you before, writes in her Advent series about the nearness of God. And here's what she says. Near is about both time and place, both imminence and immanence. There's one letter difference, but the meaning of the words are very different. Imminence speaks to God's immediacy, and immanence reveals a God who dwells within. The God who is both imminent and immanent in our lives was also present to Israel thousands of years ago during one of the very difficult times in their history. They'd been conquered as a nation by Babylon, and many had been taken captive to live in a foreign land. They were in exile. And then God speaks to them through the prophet Isaiah, and the first word God says, this is what Helen was sharing us with us this morning, the first word God says is comfort. Give comfort to my people, says your God. And then Isaiah goes on, speaking tenderly to Jerusalem. Or uh, He says, speak tenderly to Jerusalem and say your sins are forgiven. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain made low, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed. You can almost feel the hope of God's people beginning to rise up within them with those words. And yet, I think you can't blame them for asking, well, when is this going to happen? Where should we look to find the one who brings comfort and hope? When is it coming? Where is this God? If we keep listening, I think Isaiah tells us that the one who will heal us is already here. In verse 9, we hear this. Go up to a high mountain, lift your voice, say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. Here is your God. Not just in some wonderful future, but right now. Here is your God. The shepherd who gathers us in his arms and carries us home is here. The people were already in his arms. And so are we. Yes, the people of Israel had lost so much, and their world was confusing and strange, and I'm sure God felt far away. But the God who saves had not gone anywhere. Again, to quote Reverend Renninger, the people had wandered away from God, but the Lord was with them in their suffering in their exile. God was already with them. Isaiah reveals that God is already at work and is making it possible for the people to experience the joy of homecoming. They were looking for a Lord who was already there. 
When John the baptizer appears in the wilderness east of Jerusalem, he announced that one more powerful than he is coming, one who would baptize with the Holy Spirit. That one is coming, says John. And in preparation for his coming, John tells us to repent. Remember the repent game I used to play with the kids? They'd start here, run to the end of the aisle. I'd say repent. They'd turn around and come back. I'd say repent. They'd turn around. Repent means to turn around, to change our ways, to change our direction. We are called to confess our sins and receive the baptism of repentance. Why is that? Well, it's because he is coming. And even as John told them to get ready for the Messiah's coming, they didn't quite realize that the Messiah was already there. He had been in their midst for 30 years, living up in Nazareth with Mary and Joseph. The Savior whose coming was announced by John was already living in their neighborhood. Maybe they didn't see him because he looked so ordinary, so human. Many people in our world wonder, where is God? And when is God coming to straighten out this mess we've made of things? Today is the second Sunday of Advent, as I said, the Sunday of peace. There is incredible peace we can all access when we remember that God is with us. We are not alone. Even when we are in the direst of circumstances, when we're scared, when we feel so alone, we're not. God is as close as those glasses on our heads. Closer, in fact, because God has chosen to dwell in each one of us, deep inside, in our hearts. And you can't get much closer than that. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a video of a storm raging above an ocean. Underwater cameras capture what happens at the surface and where everything is flying this way and that and waves are crashing and wind is howling. But as you go deeper under the ocean, uh, uh, things start to be calmer. And as you go down and down and down to the very bottom, it's actually quite peaceful. The plants are moving just a little bit. They're flowing gently back and forth. To look at them, you'd barely know that there was a storm raging above them. And I think the same can be true for us when we remember that God's promise that God is with us right here and right now, imminently and immensely, immanently, in the middle of each of our own storms. Jake Owensby, a bishop in the Episcopal Church, writes of his experience with his dog named Gracie. And perhaps many of you have experienced the same thing with your beloved pets. He writes, Thunderstorms terrify Gracie. She's our lab terrier hound mix. Before I can hear even the faintest rumble, Gracie has started trembling. Looking for comfort, she usually crawls up into my lap, and I hold her and gently stroke her back until the storm blows over. You're okay, I tell her. I've got you. Now, dog time and human time are different. The gift of being a dog is that Gracie tends to be completely absorbed in the moment. When we're playing with the ball or walking in the woods, she's all in. There's no fretting about tomorrow's plans or stressing about a looming deadline at work. She's totally present in the moment. The downside of Gracie's sense of time is that she can't put things in a broader context. When the wind blows and the lightning flashes, all she knows is the storm and her terror. By contrast, you and I may dislike extreme weather, It might even scare us, but we do have the ability to put it in perspective. That's because we have a sense of the past, past and the future, and we know the storm will pass. But it's important to remember that even though we humans can see a bigger picture than our pets can, we will never know the whole story. We glimpse possible futures, 
but those are possible futures and their glimpses at best. Where the world is heading, where our nation is heading, where our individual lives are leading, that's never going to be a matter of certainty for anyone. No amount of education or sophistication provides humans a completely reliable crystal ball. The news media reminds us relentlessly that we're in an existential storm these days. Our future is uncertain and even perilous. Climate change, geopolitical shifts, the rise of authoritarianism abroad and at home, foreign wars and domestic violence, economic uncertainty, and we are not sure how any of this is going to turn out. If the world is governed entirely by natural law, it's hard to believe that God, a being beyond the natural course of things, can act in this world. Waiting for God to act amounts to doing nothing. So if this sort of secularism is your view, you figure you have to get busy and make things happen for yourself. But on the other hand, in a world as fraught and perilous and heartbreaking as ours, the Christian spiritual posture is to wait. And waiting is not passive. Waiting is carrying on in love with the expectation that God is at work through that love. Of course, God's work is not finished. And we can't with certainty say what the final result is going to be, but we can believe that it will be good. In the meantime, I find it helpful to remember this piece of wisdom from the writer of 2 Peter. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. God at once sees the whole picture, and at every moment, God is all in. We may be terrified and confused and disappointed and heartsick, and God is with us. The heart of waiting is to listen, to listen closely for the word of God. And it sounds something like this, you're okay. I've got you. So listen for that word from God, my friends, as the storms rage around us. And when you hear it, may you experience that deep peace that only God can give. Amen. too often find ourselves multitasking or obsessing about something that isn't quite right or settled or the particular way that we like it. We're very accustomed to a preoccupied mind that has little peace. In this season, we'll give ourselves a respite from this pace as we slow down in this prayer time, taking on a more peaceful rhythm. We'll begin our prayers with three questions, each followed by a short silence. Focusing intentionally on thoughts and memories can be a kind of prayer, bringing our lives into a conversation with the holy. So I would invite you to take a deep breath in and out 
and close your eyes if you are comfortable doing that. The first question is this. Who was a gift of presence to you this week? Did you experience their attention in a way that felt like a special connection? Take a moment to recall this in your mind's eye, seeing it emerge like, an opening, like opening a gift. If you can't recall such a moment, that's okay. This week, you will notice these moments more deeply. The second question is this, how did you offer yourself as a gift of presence? What did it feel like to extend your attentiveness and availability beyond yourself? Did you notice how it made a difference to someone else for you to be truly present to them? The third question is this. Is it possible that God's presence is felt more acutely in these moments when we truly tend to one another? What could you do this coming week that would allow God's gift of peace to flow through you to someone else? It may be as simple as finding opportunities to speak an encouraging word or as complex as actually lifting up someone's circumstances through volunteering or donating. In this prayerful, present moment, we train our attention on those who are in distress. We pray this week for those whose Hanukkah and Advent seasons look different this year. We pray also for those in Israel and Palestine of any, every heritage or religion who will not be covered in peace this day. As we hear unfathomable stories of sexual and physical violence, we pray for those who will never be the same. We pray for your children in Kaduna State, Northwest Nigeria, after at least 85 civilians were killed in an airstrike as they celebrated the birthday of the Prophet Muhammad. As we witness such needless acts of violence in our world, we pray that your comfort may cover us all. We pray for comfort for those everywhere as natural disasters and weather effects, uh, events affect the lives of so many throughout the globe. We pray for those who are fearful, even when they are in their own homes, for whatever reason. Comfort them, Lord. And we pray for those who are experiencing ill health of body, mind, or spirit. Be with them and bring them comfort and peace as only you can. 
In this prayerful present moment, we train our attention also on thanksgiving and joy. We give thanks this week for the overflowing love boxes in our midst. Thank you for each of the givers. We pray for those who will receive our gifts of love, that through these gifts you may be very real and present to them. In this prayerful, present moment, we ask you, Christ Jesus, the greatest gift of all, to help us savor our journey toward the celebration of Christmas. Help us recognize and create moments of sweet presence rather than filling the voids with things that do not last. Help us to stop and notice what we're experiencing and accept it with open hearts and minds. In doing this, we allow you to meet us in the right here, right now, right where we are. Amen. This Sunday in Advent celebrates God's gift of peace. When we look around the world, we see so many places where peace is missing, in neighborhoods and within nations. But because we know the gift of God's peace, we can trust that our gifts will help to restore true peace to souls and situations through the power of the Holy Spirit. Our offering will now be received. of promise we offer our gifts in Jesus name for we know peace through his forgiveness and his faithfulness bless our gifts and bless our lives help us to share the peace you offer with lives that touch ours throughout this world you love amen well we close our service with a Christmas carol again this week Henry Wadsworth, Longworth, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow knew the chaos and sorrow of life. Sinking into a depression after his wife died and his son was badly injured in the Civil War. When Longfellow heard the bells on Christmas Day, he was encouraged that peace could come again one day 
to a troubled nation. And we carry that same hope for peace this day. We're going to sing now, I Heard the Bells on Christmas Day. strip away the cluttered surface of our lives and become more present in the moment, we may be disturbed by what we can now see in the open vista, especially the suffering of the least of these. We are no longer numb to the cries of the hurting. We ache for the violence humans do to one another and to the earth. We see all people and all creation held within God's love and life. Our comfortable lives are disrupted as we ask new and hard questions. But being more mindfully present will also bring a greater awareness of God's presence and peace and clarity in the midst of it all. So go now and be truly present, so you may be a gift of presence to others. That's all that is expected, that the gift that is you is the best gift you can give. In the name of the Holy Presence, the divine gift and the spirit of peace that is just waiting for us to unwrap abundant life. Amen. Peace, peace, peace. 